This episode is brought to you by Cox Home Life. Cox helps make your home smarter. And now you can pull up your home life cameras on your TV with your contour voice remote and some simple voice commands. To learn more, visit cox.com slash this is home. This podcast is coming to you on MPN, the marketing podcast network. There's another show on MPN you might like as well. I'm Nick Westergaard, host of the On Brand Podcast. Each week, I interview marketing thought leaders or those working for innovative brands like Adobe, Ben & Jerry's, HBO, Salesforce, and Whole Foods. You'll learn how to tell stronger stories and build better brands. Just visit onbrandpodcast.com or search for On Brand with Nick Westergaard wherever you like to listen. This is the Marketing Podcast Network. Want Instagrammers and YouTubers to mention your brand, or do you want to influence an audience to buy your product? I'm Jason Falls, author of the book Winfluence, reframing influencer marketing to ignite your brand. In this podcast, we explore the people, companies, campaigns, and stories that illustrate the difference between using influencers and actually influencing. Welcome to Winfluence, the influence marketing podcast. Hello again, friends. Thanks for listening to Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast. Many of you know I host another podcast on the Marketing Podcast Network called Digging Deeper. Occasionally on that show, we interview someone that has a perspective or focus on something that either is or is closely related to influence marketing. When we do, I like to share that interview here as well. Why not make sure you get the good intel too? Last week, I had the pleasure of chatting with Mark Anderson and Ryan Fay. Those names may or may not ring a bell with you, but they might if you just call them Mark and Faye. They are the Grill Dads, hosts of the popular Food Network show where two backyard grill jockeys cook up tasty recipes and some good humor for all to see. But Mark and Faye are actually ad agency guys who started cooking out for friends, then for some pop-up restaurants and food trucks in the Los Angeles area. They then entered one of Guy Fieri's cooking competitions and won. Now, they don't just do the show. They have day jobs, too. Ryan is still a creative director in the ad world. Mark is running a different kind of business these days, but still with his normal creative tendencies. I talked to the Grill Dads about the show, the social engine that drives it, where they see content marketing and creative leading both brands and influencers these days, and a lot more. It was a fun, funny, and useful conversation, so I've pulled that interview out of Digging Deeper to share with you today. While I'm thinking about it, though, you should probably jump over and subscribe to Digging Deeper as well if you aren't already. On that show, I tend to talk more to brand side marketers and experts about marketing strategy, creative, and such from a more broad level than we typically get into on Winfluence. You can find that show and links to all its various subscription platforms at cornet.online slash digging deeper. And stick around after the interview today, folks. I've got a few housekeeping notes that will be of interest to you concerning some events that you might want to attend. Before we hear from the Grill Dads, though, let's talk a little about listening. We've heard the last few episodes from Pete Kennedy, the founder and president at Tagger, the complete influencer marketing software that happens to be the presenting sponsor of this show. Tagger has a new feature out called Signals. It's a form of social listening, but specific to influencers and influencer topics. Pete and I chatted recently about signals so you could understand more about what it brings to Tagger. Pete, tell me, tell me what the inspiration was for signals. Where did the idea come from? Yeah, it came from the need of having a strategy platform for our clients. You know, most marketers are not strategists. And so they see all this data about influencer marketing, about brands, about influencers, and they're like, where do I begin? And that was the reason why we created signals was to create a tech enabled strategy tool for them. So that you can really understand what's happening in your industry, what's happening with competitors, what topics are important that you should be able to create tentpole events around. Um, So it really was a strategy uh, need. And then we also looked at our clients' needs of pulling data. A lot of times they'd come to us with really detailed, really difficult data pools that would take 24 hours for our tech team to pull for them. Now they can do that in a matter of seconds with signals. Thanks to Pete and to Tagger for the great product and for helping bring this podcast to you each week. To learn more and get a demo to see if Tagger is right for you, even if it's just to check out the new signals feature, just visit jason.online slash Tagger today. 
That's jason.online slash tagger. Get out your bibs. It's time for a barbecue. Mark Anderson and Ryan Fay. Mark and Fay, the Grill Dads, are next on Winfluence. So what happens when two ad executives get together and start cooking out for people at backyard barbecues? Well, they apparently get handpicked by Guy Fieri to be on a competition show, then win it and score their own food network program, become international superstars, launch their own line of spices and appeal and so on. Kind of makes you wonder what the hell they're doing here. But they are here and we're going to get into why. Good morning to the Grill Dads, Mark and Faye. Jason, good Good morning. Good morning, man. Very good morning and welcome to the show, guys. Mark, let's start with you. Why don't you tell us your version of how the two of you got started grilling together and wound up hosting a TV show? Oh, man. I mean, to us, cooking has always been a creative outlet. Um, And, you know, I I started out as a tour manager in the music business. I studied marketing and advertising in school, but I went straight out on tour. Um, And one of the first times I cooked for Uh, Ryan and his roommates uh, was I lied to the band members in Maroon 5 and told them I lived in New York City uh, because they were looking to hire a sound person for a show at Irving Plaza. And uh, I went out, crashed on uh, Faye's couch, um, ended up getting hired by them to go out on the road for about nine months. Um, And they went from opening for Guster to being the number one band in the world in that nine months, which was crazy. But I had a couple of days off and I just I was like, you know, my way to thank Faye and his uh, roommates for letting me stay there was to cook. Um, and then uh, and then, you know, did that a couple of times and then we cooked together and then Faye moved to L.A. And then, you know, all of a sudden that was our connection. That's what we like when we had downtime. It was <laughs> cooking and specifically grilling. Um, and you know, over time, like we would just tell people, Hey, we're going to grill out this weekend. And before we knew it, 60 people were coming. Um, we had a restaurant come in and ask us like, Hey, your food is awesome. And you guys are marketers and doing all this stuff. Can you guys do a guest restaurant takeover, guest executive chef restaurant takeover? We did that three or four times. And, um, thanks to Faye and, uh, his ability to promote, uh, we sold those all out in advance with multiple seatings. And uh, we're like, hey, let's open a restaurant. My dad, who's in commercial banking, said that's the worst mistake you could ever make in your life. (laughs) Um, And I think he said to us, the lucky ones fail quickly. Um, And so we decided to, you know, we really wanted to do something with this. So we created the idea of the Grill Dads, came up with a concept for a show um, called The Search for California Barbecue. We called uh, a production company that we had given tons of commercial work to and said, hey, we're calling in the favor. We need you to help us shoot a trailer for Kickstarter. And um, they're like, great, we're on it. So two grip trucks, four cameras, 17 hours, 11 locations. We shot this thing. And uh, my wife, who's a creative director in advertising, watched this. And um, Faye will attest to this. Um, My wife doesn't hold back on feedback. She's a very direct creative director. (laughs) And she watched this uh, video and she said, you two idiots are going to be on Food Network. Um, You're going to be on TV. And um, so we got it to... uh, Mark Summers, who had a big Food Network career after Double Dare, uh, who got it to Guy Fieri. um, And Guy and Mark were going to co-EP a pilot for us. And then Guy got his show, Guy's Big Project, uh, greenlit. And we decided to kind of like launch the show through that show, which was nerve wracking as cynical adults (laughs) to go into uh, a, uh, a reality show environment. And um, holy shit, we won. Um, And so we got... You know, they we won six episodes of a show. They instantly uh, expanded it to 10. Uh, they booked us for a second season. We do, you know, judging on all their stuff. So that's that was really the takeoff. Um, we It took years and years of planning. But from the time that we launched the Kickstarter to us being in a restaurant filming our own show, I think it was like eight months. That's crazy. Now, Faye, I know both of you are ad business guys, which is, or have those those backgrounds, which is why coming here today makes sense for us. Yeah. Um, though I do love a good steak or rack of ribs now and then, but um, how much <laughs> of, of your background, I mean, Mark mentioned, you know, your ability to promote here. How much of your background as a, an ad executive or creative helped you position this whole grilling thing to get where you are? No, I mean, it's a really good question. A, a lot of people are like, wow, you guys just found this thing. It just happened, right? Like, you know, I'm like, opportunity sure looks a lot like hard work. So, you know, for us, 
Um, you know, I, I had been a, a PR guy in New York, uh, working for a, a firm called Ruder Fenn and then found my way at 24 years old at TBWA shy day running PR. So I was the head of PR for North America for that shop, which basically meant I got a gift to gab. I get free bagels in the morning. I was pretty, you know, in pretty good fucking shape actually. So I was, uh, feeling good about everything. And then I, uh, moved uh, they moved me to Los Angeles because I was going to start the branded content division of Shia Day um, at the time. This is way, way long time ago. Uh, 2001, 2099 or so. Uh, mm-hmm. Anyway, I decided uh, that I didn't like the corporate structure and started Omelette. So I founded an agency myself with uh, two other guys um, and I ran it for 13 years. So I was the kind of last partner standing. And uh, I think Mark and I, <laughs> Mark worked there also. Cause he, you know, no one wants to hire that guy. So like, you know, I said, oh, I just come on over. I'll give you some free water and hang After out. nine months, I was approving his payroll. This no. is true. Actually. <laughs> very, very true. <laughs> yes. I always wondered why I got less than everyone else too. Now I understand Mark. So <laughs> yeah, man. So, you know, I think, I think Mark and I were pretty creatively stifled. Like once you get to a certain level, uh, you no longer do, you just oversee. And I think Mark and I have been guys our whole careers that we like to do as well. So, yeah. you know, we, we love the supervisory stuff, being creative directors and ECDs and CCOs, but at the same time, we still like to actually get in there and create. So the grill dads was, was a, a collective desire to be creative, to be honest. And it was just also an experiment, man. I think Anderson and I were like, if we can do these, this brand building stuff for everybody else. Can we do it for ourselves? Yeah. And that was, I mean, I think, I think every creative on the planet has this exact same idea, right? It's yeah. not, Let's let's build IP because you know the only way to make money in advertising is if your eyes are open. Yeah. And what we want to do is close our eyes and make money. So it's an <laughs> IP based exercise, right? Very We're, nice. Uh, and Mark, you mentioned that you know your your wife sort of saying you know you guys are you jokers mm-hmm. are going to wind up on the Food Network. Was that the moment when you thought we could actually have a cable show, or was the cable show the idea all along? <clears throat> you know, the cable show was the pie in the sky. Um, and we did the Kickstarter thing, which I keep saying Kickstarter, I think technically it was Indiegogo, but, um, we did the crowdsourcing crowdfunding deal, not to take the money, um, of our friends and family and people who are supporting us, but we wanted to actually use that as a uh, validation of the concept. So we wanted to go to vice or box or some of these other networks that were building these awesome online mm-hmm. presence and say, hey, like the people want to see this um, and we have the resources to do it. Um, why don't we come and do it with you guys and we can cancel this thing. But, you know, it was uh, it was Mark Summers, you know, I mean, it, I cold emailed Mark Summers and just I just he's from the Midwest. Faye and I are Midwest guys. He's um, you know, he was a stand up comedian. Mm-hmm. Um, Faye and I watched, you know, Double Dare growing up and I was, you know, you know, Mark was an executive producer and creator of Restaurant Possible and some of these other things. So um, so we knew he had the relationships to get shows off the ground and we just thought it would resonate. And I emailed him an Indiegogo uh, link and said, hey, I'm Mark. I'm the smarter, better looking half the grill dads. I want to know what you think of our show. And I walked into um, I was freelancing at uh, an agency in Portland called Swift at the time. Send the email walked into a meeting and five minutes later, a Burbank phone number pulled up and I, I was like, there's no way. But I, so I went out, answered the phone and it, Mark Summers obviously has a voice that, you know, yep. um, and I was just like, you know, holy shit. He's like, Hey, this is Mark Summers. Uh, and are we allowed to swear on here, Jason? Yeah. He goes, who the fuck are you guys? <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? He goes, that's, he goes, I get these things all the time this is the best one I've ever got. He goes, it's funny. The food looks great. You guys, you know, you guys own restaurants. What are you doing? And we're like, no, we're, we're ad guys, you know? And, uh, but we, we love to cook. Um, and our lens for food is not through culinary Institute of America. It's not through, you know, Michelin stars, you know, we're, we're school hard knocks backyard warriors. And he said, come to LA on Friday. So fan, I went and met him. And so at that point, you know, it was on the path. And he said, you know, I shared this with, with Guy Fieri and, and he loved it. And then two weeks later, we're in Santa Rosa. And at that, so it felt real very quickly. I mean, again, that process was quick, but, you know, from the time that Faye and I were sitting in an office at Omelette 
thinking like, how do we do something with this grilling thing to the point where we actually hit publish on Indiegogo was year. Yeah. It was three yeah. years. Um, and three four, because yeah. we to find a way, none of us can act. Like I always joke and tell people, it's like we couldn't even get an acting award at the adult video network. Whoa, right? whoa, whoa, whoa. Speak for yourself. Don't put me in that equation. All right. And I think we, I should pull some awards. <laughs> so we knew it was critical that what we were doing was authentic to us. So we weren't, there was no persona, there was no nothing. And then once everything, once we figured that out, it, it went quick. That's great. Now, before I get into the day job, as it were, let, let's talk for a second about the content engine behind the show. Cause when you have a, a show like that, you also basically have to have kind of an active social media presence, Instagram, Facebook. I think at one point you guys had a podcast as well. Um, what's the scope of keeping that TV audience engaged off the tube so you don't see, you know, that audience wane? I mean, that's a that's a really good question. You know, it's funny. A lot of people in this world we're in right now start online and then hope to get offline. We went offline and then went online. <laughs> So we didn't have a presence at all. And so we kind of after the show, basically, we thought, my God, this is going to be amazing. The Food Network, our Instagram is going to shoot up, Facebook, everything. I think we had eight people that followed us after watching our, our first episode of the Food Network, which just shows you, you know, kind of the the, the age brackets of thing. It's no dig. It's just the reality. Right. Cable sure. show. Um, however, uh, you know, Mark and I uh, understand 360 and understand how to build out a brand and all the pipes that make sense for the target audience. So. I mean, it's hard, you know, it, it's, it's a grind. It's a real, you know, we also have other jobs, but I, I would say probably the grill dads takes the majority of our time now, or at least in quite a bit of our time, but you know, I'm, I'm an acting ECD, uh, freelance ECD for an agency right now. You know, Mark owns a company in Boise where he lives. You know, we also live apart, yeah. which is why we remain good friends is because we're, what is it? 828 miles away, Mark, from each other. Hey, you got it right. Finally. Did I get it right? Yeah. But anyway, uh, you know, but that engine you're talking about is critical. You know, we have a full time brand manager. We have a full time editor. Um, you know, we we respond to our own stuff on social. But, you know, for example, we, we're doing this thing right now called the 100 days of giveaways. And twice a week for 50 weeks, we're giving away stuff in the video, but we're not telling people what we're giving away. So on Mondays and Wednesdays, you got to watch it. You got to register in the comments below by tagging somebody. Mm-hmm. that doesn't follow us and you're registered to win. What do you win? We don't know. We won't tell you till the next video comes out. Nice. So you can win a gravy boat of a, a puking duck or a Traeger grill. Uh, <laughs> we have some really, really big prizes actually that we're giving away coming up as well. But it is just to your point, Jason, you know, it's better than anybody. It is a constant, constant, okay. constant, constant on. You can never stop. Yeah. Yeah. The minute you stop, they pay attention to somebody else and then you're, then you there's no the neutral. Back. There's no. forward and backwards. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, omelet and, you know, uh, Faye, you mentioned it and, and talked about the agency a little bit, but um, I know that that rip that agency uh, both had and has quite the reputation in the agency uh, world out there. Some Clio's, some can lions, event marketer awards. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about how omelet began and, uh, and how it evolved. Omelet honestly grew out of angst and frustration for how the corporate structure works at larger agencies. Um, and we didn't understand why the practice of inhuman spreadsheets was what was being applied to people. And uh, I think that was my biggest, probably one of my biggest strengths and also probably one of my biggest weaknesses in business. You know, I think advertising is a business. It's not an art form necessarily, in my opinion. So I think we do our best with the tools that we have um, to create ideas that make people want to buy stuff. Uh, or engage with things. So once you understand the business of creativity, it gets really fun and sexy. Um, And we try to omelet to be a bit of, you know, I'd say the counter shop. I mean, that was something that was in my, my credo from the beginning. I I don't necessarily know in terms of, you know, where it is now, but, you know, because I've been out of there for over, I think over four years at this point when, when I left, Um, I actually still have some ownership over the company, but, you know, I, I don't know. It's just, it's, I think a lot of creative, we, we started also as not award-winning, a lot of creatives, award-winning creatives and award-winning people start shops. We had zero awards when we started Omelette. We just had a desire to do things a bit differently. Um, and honestly, we also hired people that were not traditional. Uh, I think at the time in, in, you know, I think Crispin Porter was a big proponent of like, we're going to hire an anthropologist and a sociologist and all this. Well, we hired a baker, we hired a comedian, we hired a magician, you know? And so, there were, and we hired Joker for the record. What's that? 
The magician was a mistake. The baker was great. Right. Good point. But yeah, no, Magic Mike's going to hear this and he's going to be like, what? No, Magic Mike's still, still a monster. So nice. but I, th- I think we had like a different different twist on it and to be a bit different. And we, we got a really good reputation of being good people that cared about their employees and about, you know, kind of the way we were, we were treating people. Uh, one of the reasons I left is because I didn't see it going the way it should have. So nice. So, Mark, what was it about? I, mean, I think you guys kind of, you know, earned a reputation there at Omelet for being more uh, experiential gorilla stuff. I think that's really what appealed more, at least to the two of you. You weren't just cranking out ad campaigns and billboards and stuff. Yeah. Uh, omelet yeah. was and is different in a lot of ways. So Mark, what was the impetus for that sort of non-traditional focus? Is that just how you guys think? I mean, for me, you know, I came out of, I called Faye when I was, you know, uh, in the middle of Europe tour managing Courtney Love, hating my life saying, Hey, how the hell do I get out of this? And we, you know, he was, I want to, you know, I had a marketing background and as a tour manager, especially I, you know, I did, you know, six, seven years of, tour managing American Idol contestants after they came off of the show. And my niche became working with those promotional tours because the marketing people at the labels liked me being on the road because I had a marketing brain because I was protecting, it was basically a, you know, for those promo tours, the tour manager is basically a mobile brand manager, right? Mm -hmm. You're making sure that the signings go well, you make sure the appearances go well, you make sure the performances go well. Um, you make sure the content that's captured, you know, represents the art as well. So my evolution with the help of Faye was from that into experiential marketing, because that was the most natural evolution from the touring world for me. But I went to work at a place in Atlanta that had great people, um, but they they weren't a big part of the creative process. So they they worked for an agency, worked for a brand. And I very quickly, I remember I called Faye after being a couple months there. I'm like, I have to work for the agency that works directly for the brand because we're, we're not creative, we're order takers. And um, so I started working on that. Um, 2008, making that place disappear almost overnight helped me with uh, going out there. But so when I had the opportunity, because I actually brought Omelette in to work with the agency and we did some AT&T stuff together. And then, uh, so I had the opportunity actually to get an omelet because they booked an experiential tour for, a- I think it was for A&E. Um, and, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, we just kind of saw the value and I got excited about the creative side of things. And then, you know, as an agency, we quickly switched away from like, Hey, we have an experiential division. We want to get in touch with the experiential uh, brand managers at brands. And we started realizing that what we were doing was actually, it was experiential, but it was actually social media work. Because if you create something that's conversation worthy Mm -hmm. offline, people talk about it online, which was the whole point of social platforms at the beginning. (laughs) So we really got into doing these like press worthy, stunt worthy, social worthy stunts. And we were doing stuff for when we launched V for HBO our experiential campaign crushed the social campaign in social. Um, and that, that to me was really exciting because at the time that was a really different way of looking at it. But honestly, the real, the real reason why I always loved working there was sitting in the creative brainstorms. Yeah. The weird, amazing, epic, d- disturbing, yeah. brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Omelette had some of the best. Creative. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. You know, you asked about Omelette, like even to this day, they have some of the best creative minds and I just really, the creative process is the best part of the creative business. And it's only about 5% of the actual business. So, you know, when you get those nuggets, you like really celebrate it, you know, and and hold it, hold it tight. Let's uh, talk about, let's talk about that for a sec. Is, you know, Mark, you mentioned, you you mentioned something in that answer there that kind of raised (laughs) my antenna went up. You talked about getting press and I've heard a lot of, um, you know, people when they are asked about their creative approach, uh, especially kind of from a, an organizational standpoint, it's like, well, we focus on buzzworthy ideas or we try to create, you know, executions that get headlines, all that. It's all sort of the same thing. So when you guys sat down then or sit down now to kick off a creative project, where are you headed? What's the what's the, the bigger sort of purpose that you're there? I mean, I guess it depends on, you know, the brief. And, you know, what's it's the thing that's really interesting for us now is, um, you know, like the the from an online standpoint, the the pandemic actually created huge opportunity for us. So we were watching all these restaurants fail because of the pandemic, but 
brands were moving their money online and specifically one of the 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 conversations that was happening that was super important was around people were learning to cook at home for the first time because they restaurants were closed they had nothing else to do and you know we we kind of joke that in 2019 the biggest thing in food was the chef that won top chef in 2020 the biggest thing in food was your sourdough start right <laughs> it was a complete change so we had um our offline presence before but the online presence blew up for us during that time. So we we have this thing where yes, we're booking deals now to do work for brands, but we're we're doing deals where we're the ad agency, the production company, and the talent. So we're directing and filming a commercial for a grill in Sonoma in two weeks. And we're acting at all those different levels. And we did that four or five times last year. Mm-hmm. And it's a really really interesting space for us because, you know, you know, brands do this all the time. Like they'll sponsor something and they don't know what to do with the sponsorship. And then, so Faye and I, you know, they'll want to work with the grill dads and then they'll come to us and they're like, I don't know how to work with the grill dads. And then we ask for their marketing brief so that we could find out like where our goals intersect and come up with a cool idea and their minds are blown. Um, and then, I mean, we actually had a major brand, a sausage company ask us if we would be interested in, doing freelance creative for their advertising group. So now we're doing, you know, we're hitting all these multiple layers, which is kind of exciting to watch it all come together. Well, And Jason, that's, what's really interesting. Like unlike most other influencers and many other chefs and things like that, we, we understand KPIs, what ROIs, but all, all the eyes, right. We understand kind of the vernacular of the brands. We understand what brand values are, how to build a long tail relationship with your consumer, what the perceived values. We understand NPS, like, that's the weird thing is like, we're not just eye candy. You know what I mean? I mean, I think. Well, that's part of it I, depends on the audience, I guess, but, uh, but I, I can, I can, I can get that. So, so Faye <laughs> on that note, it is what you're doing a, a bit of a blueprint for influencers today to kind of become that extension of a brand's creative team. Yeah. I mean, I, I do believe that um, here's the difference though. Um, A lot of creators also can direct and produce and write, et cetera. But the difference is we understand the fundamental business of advertising, of creativity in business. So we can work with C-suite executives and have frank conversations with them because we have zero fear. Uh, And it's honestly about what your goals are. And if we have a collective vision and we both share a vision, we can actually crush the content then because it's seamless. I think a lot of times you get an agency that doesn't believe in something, but they want the money. Or you get creators that are just like, I'm just going to take the coin. I'm going to do these one-offs. Well, we're into building relationships. We're not into doing just one-off beats. Um, I think that's a big lesson that a lot of, uh, I think, influencers don't get, which is why, you know, for us, whether it's endemic brands, CPGs, you know, automobiles, vacation, recreation, family, dads, et cetera, we're actually a super easy group to work with because we're the guys. Yeah. So we can deliver the messages and be the talent and do it in real time without fear and have fun doing it. We have our own, you know, tone. We have this comedy duo thing that we've been doing and it's not fake. It's, you know, yeah. Mark's an asshole and I'm a nice guy. So we play those <laughs> off of each other. You know, <laughs> Very nice. Mark, I can assure you, he he told me that beforehand. When I did. Before, before he, I he, he agrees with it. I I think he nailed it. <laughs> All right. Hey, you know, if if as, as long as you know, then everybody's on the same page. So, Mark, are either of you, uh, and either of you can answer this, but we'll just start with Mark since Faye answered the last one. Are either of you spending much time or thinking about the metaverse? How do you think that's going to change what we do in the world of advertising, branding, marketing? Um, you know, it's it, it's interesting. I mean, we look at anything that comes up like that through the lens of our brand, right? So, which is something that is, I think comes with age and experience, you know, we're, we're fairly measured. I mean, we, the power of no for, you know, both brand opportunities for us and opportunities for us to expand our brand ourselves, like looking at something like, Hey, we don't know enough about that. We don't see a clear fit for us. Um, You know, there's no, so for us, it's like, you know, right now it's not part of our DNA as people. So it's hard for us to go in there and authentically be a part of that world. 
Um, but you know, it's, it's still pretty new. Well, yes. But you know, the idea of, of doing, an environment where you can be something or experience something that you can't in the real world is the whole point of the entire exercise. So second life was something we lived through yep. and have been in where brands got involved. You know, we kind of chuckle a little bit. It comes every 10 years or so, 15 years, <laughs> another one of these pops up. I mean, it's gamifying your life. Like I want to yep. play my life, right. But I want to play my life. Not as me. I want to play my life in there where there are no consequences or at least the consequences are not physical necessarily. So I think, that's a piece of it. Like I got some friends of mine that are high up at Roblox and some other places and to see what they're doing with animation and, and, and music concerts, like the Travis Scott, like all sorts of interesting things that are going on. Brands are always looking for other ways to spend money to reach a certain consumer. It's just another media. It's literally another media buy. Yeah. Just like yeah. any other social network. It just happens to be dictated right now by the technology companies. Uh, who are actually building these platforms and 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 giving us the ability to play life, and uh, it's another release, you know. Yeah. Well, I've and one thing that I've sort of translated it for our clients here. See if you guys how you guys react to this. I think the metaverse is really one hundred percent all about the experience. I don't think yep. any of it's necessary. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you can do a Zoom meeting or you can go in a virtual world and have a meeting. You can have a concert that you stream live on Netflix or, or wherever, or you can go and put on an Oculus and watch it in, in three, 360. It's not necessary, but it's really cool. And if you can build a really good experience for your brand that makes sense to the audience that is experiencing it in the metaverse, then you're going to win. Otherwise you're just kind of, you know, treading water. Yeah. But I mean, there's going to be levels of involvement, you know, like for example, if brand a, controls the environment in the experience there's no reason why brand c d e and f can't come in and just be a small piece of that just like any other sponsorship in any other venue you've got tier a all the way through the other one so they still can be involved but more passively more like an ad versus to your point which is an experience you know that's actually all mark and i offer yeah is an actual experience with engagement versus just a passive experience which is what you watch on cable tv right passive well, guys, I know uh, both of you got up early in your time zones. We certainly appreciate your wisdom here today. I'll, I'll start with Mark. If the audience wants to find you online and perhaps connect, where do they go? Uh, at the Grill Dads. <clears throat> uh, you'll find uh, a personal social media account to be uh, incredibly boring pictures of uh, my son and I skiing. So, yeah, everything everything we do is at the Grill Dads, and that works, you know, uh, across pretty much, pretty much every platform. And, uh um, yeah, that's us. Awesome. Well, our, new to add? our new website is launching soon too. So it's just going to be the girl dads.com, but we're going to have a brand new site up. Uh, what in the next two weeks, Mark, not even yeah, next couple of weeks. And you know, our, our big plug, I mean, we have a cookbook coming out, um, this summer, um, supply chain might have an impact on that date. It's called the, uh, best grilling cookbook ever written by two idiots. Um, <laughs> so we, you know, titled it aptly so we can live up to it. And uh, Eva Longoria did our forward. Um, but man, we would really love for people to connect and have fun with this year of 100 giveaways we're doing on Instagram right now. That's fantastic. Well, gentlemen, uh, thank you for your time again today. We look forward to some more great content on whatever channel it comes from. Uh, Instagram certainly the priority right now. But uh, thank you both for spending some time with us today here on Digging Deep. That sure was fun. Again, my talk with Mark and Faye originally aired on my other podcast, Digging Deeper. You can add that show to your listening queue by going to cornet.online slash digging deeper or searching for Digging Deeper Cornet wherever you get your podcasts. If you'd ever like to join us for the live stream of Digging Deeper, by the way, it's also a video show that airs on Tuesday mornings at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific time on Cornet's social channels. Just look for Team Cornet. On Twitter, Facebook, or LinkedIn, there's also a special Digging Deeper YouTube channel you can find at cornet.online slash dig deep. Also, some quick notes and housekeeping items for you this week. Next week, I will be speaking about influencer marketing at Social Media Marketing World. If you're going to be in San Diego for the event, flag me down. Let's catch up. For those of you who would like to attend that event virtually or in person, if you're getting a last minute ticket, there are some discounted tickets at jason.online slash smmw. That's jason.online slash smmw. 
which is basically the acronym for Social Media Marketing World, jason.online slash SMMW. The virtual ticket for the event is like 50% off there. So dial that up and join us online for Social Media Marketing World. I'm excited to attend for the first time, and we'll certainly be talking about influencer marketing. And I've been invited to help chair one of the stages at the first ever New York version of the Influencer Marketing Show in New York City on April 27th. I hope to bring you ticket information and perhaps a discount or giveaway soon. So keep listening to the podcast regularly, folks. As soon as I have a way for you to join me in New York for the Influencer Marketing Show, the first in North America, it's been in London for several years. I'll pass that on to you, of course. And don't forget, I love feedback, and you can help make a future episode of Winfluence awesome. Ask your question about influence or influence marketing that you want my answer to or take on. Record a voice memo and send it via email or just send a regular email to jason at jasonfalls.com. I may use your comment on a future episode or your question to inspire a show topic. If I do, I'll send you a signed copy of Winfluence the book as a thank you. Winfluence, the Influence Marketing Podcast, is presented by my book, Winfluence, Reframing Influencer Marketing to Ignite Your Brand. Get your copy online at winfluencebook.com. While you're there, sign up for the latest ideas about influence marketing delivered in my monthly newsletter, or book me to speak to your company or organization about influence marketing. If you or someone you know is an influencer, a brand manager that uses influence marketing, or one of the many amazing people working in the influence marketing services world, and they would make a good guest for the show, email me at jason at jasonfalls.com. Our theme music is One More Look by the K-Club and Grammy Award-winning producer Jaquire King. Thanks for listening, and remember, when it's not about the person, but about results, it's Winfluence. This podcast comes to you from the Marketing Podcast Network. I'm Shell Holtz, co-host of For Immediate Release, also on MPN. I'm Neville Hobson, co-host of FIR, where since 2005, Shell and I have been exploring changing technologies, behaviors, and organizations, and what this means for you. Our monthly show takes a deep dive into these issues, and shorter episodes focus on hot topics and emerging trends. Visit marketingpodcasts.net or search for FIR Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast.